Does the type of fermentation vessel used in brewing affect the final beer? Well, years ago, I experimented by brewing the same beer in two different vessels, a $900 stainless conical fermenter and a $25 plastic one. Norm and I were convinced we could tell a difference. Not as much of an aroma off this one. But were our expectations influencing us? Well, in true brewlosophy fashion, we have data from blinded participants. Using a glass carboy as the control, we're comparing beers fermented in a PET carboy, a stainless brew bucket, and a corny keg. Does the fermentation vessel matter? Let's find out. This episode is sponsored by Yakima Valley Hops. More on them in a bit. With all the many variables to consider in brewing, how much difference does a fermentation vessel make to the end product? Now, I've heard arguments regarding the effect of fermenter geometry, the amount of headspace, and specifically O2 permeability. I mean, after all, if there was no difference, then why would you spend hundreds of dollars on fancy gear when a plastic bucket will do? Well, to put this to the test, we have put together three experiments. And in each one, we took wort and we split it between a good old fashioned glass carboy and a different fermentation vessel, then served the beers to blinded participants to see if they could detect a difference. So let's start with a California common where the purpose of the experiment was to evaluate the differences between beers produced using the same process where one was fermented in a PET carboy and the other in a glass carboy. PET has an oxygen permeability of about 0.02 to 0.05 cubic centimeters per square meter per day at atmospheric pressure and room temperature, which is a long way of saying it's pretty low. Uh, but not as low as the oxygen permeability of glass, which is effectively zero. Now, both fermenters are the same shape, so no difference is there, but could the plastic also hold off flavors? Well, one way to find out. Marshall Sharp brewed a California Common, split the work between the PET and glass carboys and added yeast to each. 28 hours post pitch, the glass carboy was actively fermenting while the beer in the PET carboy looked, well, dead. An odd finding, but at 40 hours post-pitch, the beers were actively fermenting. Four days post-pitch, the fermentation was still active, and three days after that, with fermentation on both beers appearing complete, Marshall took hydrometer measurements that showed each was sitting at a desirably dry 1.009 SG. The beers were cold crashed, fined, and carbonated, and came out looking great. Now, could tasters tell them apart? Well, a total of 25 people participated in this experiment, each blindly served one sample of the beer fermented in a PET carboy and two samples of the beer fermented in a glass carboy. While 13 tasters would have had to accurately identify the odd beer out of this sample size, 14 were able to do so, suggesting participants in this experiment were reliably able to distinguish the beers. Now, tasters who correctly chose the unique sample were asked to compare the two different beers and provide feedback on the one they preferred. Strikingly, a majority of 10 tasters reported a preference for the beer fermented in glass, while two preferred the beer fermented in PET and two perceived no difference or preference. Marshall, for his part, could not tell the beers apart at all. To him, the aroma, flavor, and mouthfeel were the same. So an interesting, significant result to start us off. So let's try this again with a stainless brew bucket. Stainless steel is the most common material used by modern professional brewers to ferment beer in, and the SS Brewtech brew bucket used here also has a conical bottom, so it's a different shape to the glass carboy. Now, Marshall was the brewer again, this time using an American IPA recipe. The purpose of the experiment was to evaluate the differences between beers produced using the same process where one was fermented in a stainless steel vessel and the other in a glass carboy. So, same brew day process, and the work was split evenly between the stainless bucket and the glass carboy. Now, one downside to fermenting in stainless is it does make observing fermentation characteristics a tad tricky. So we don't know if the beers showed active fermentation signs at the same time or not here. But regardless, after 10 days, gravity readings were taken confirming both beers had reached the same FG of 1.007. The beers were cold crashed, fined, and carbonated. The finished beers looked close in appearance, but the beer fermented in the stainless bucket was noticed to be clearer. Perhaps a function of the conical bottom better separating the clear beer from the tube. So visually different, but 
And what about perceptively? Well, a total of 19 people participated in this experiment, each blindly served one sample of the beer fermented in a stainless steel bucket and two samples of the beer fermented in a glass carboy. While 11 tasters would have to accurately identify the odd beer out at this sample size, only five were able to do so, suggesting participants in this experiment were not reliably able to distinguish the beers. Now, when thinking of the perceptible impacts different fermenters could have, my mind always goes to oxidation as a primary cause. Now, stainless steel is virtually impermeable to gases, much like glass, so it provides an excellent barrier against oxygen ingress, which to my mind may go some way to explaining why this experiment came back as non-significant while the PET fermented batch was reliably distinguishable. Now, our last experiment looks at another type of stainless vessel, a corny keg, but before we get to that, a quick word on today's sponsor, Yakima Valley Hops. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world. I'm using Yakima Valley Hops in every badge I brew. Carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern flavors like Galaxy and Mosaic and many more. Home brewers can select specific crop years and most hops come in two, eight and 16 ounce packages. I personally love using the eight ounce bags which give me plenty of hops for a brew day and I can store any leftovers in my freezer. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com to see everything they have to offer. Now a growing trend in home brewing is fermenting in standard corny kegs. I've done it a bunch of times myself. It's a convenient way to significantly reduce oxygen from yeast pitch through serving. So when comparing to a glass carboy, oxygen permeability is not really a differentiating factor here. But what about the impact of vessel dimension, specifically whether fermenting in a tall cylindrical keg produces a qualitative difference compared to beer fermented in other types of fermenters? The surface area of the fermenting beer in a standard carboy is greater than in a tall skinny keg, which means more contact with Krausen as well as whatever oxygen may be contained in the headspace. Also, because of the smaller diameter of a keg, there is less contact between the beer and the yeast cake, which might have an impact on flavors as well. So, time for an experiment to evaluate the differences between beers where one was fermented in a glass carboy and the other in a stainless steel corny keg. Former Brewdosophy contributor Greg Foster brewed an American Amber Ale going the extra mile to ensure both vessels received the same volume of wort by weighing both the keg and carboy empty, filling each based on weight, then moving the hose back and forth in order to equalize any kettle trube that made it out of the kettle. Both vessels were then placed in a temperature controlled chamber, otherwise known as Greg's chest freezer. Now at the end of fermentation, both beers reached a similar final gravity, 1.012 for the keg and 1.013 for the carboy. We'll call that even. Now the beers were cold crashed and racked to serving kegs. Even without the use of gelatin, both beers looked similarly clear when it came time to collect data. A total of 29 participants took our triangle test where each participant was blindly served one sample of the beer fermented in a corny keg and two samples of the beer fermented in a glass carboy. While the minimum number of correct responses required to reach statistical significance here was 15, a total of 16 tasters accurately identified the unique sample. Participants could reliably distinguish the beers. Of the 16 accurate tasters, the carboy fermented beer was preferred by six tasters, Three report liking the keg fermented beer more, and the others, well, they either had no preference or felt there was no difference. So, twice as many participants preferred the glass carboy beer to the keg beer. So, both this experiment and the PET carboy one produced statistically significant results in perception, and the stainless bucket produced a difference in beer clarity, all of which indicates fermentation vessel does have an impact on the resulting beer at least across these three data points. So maybe Norm and I weren't deceiving ourselves after all. Now look, I'd imagine everybody watching this video has used multiple things to ferment beer in. So let me know, which is your fermentation vessel of choice and why? Now there are many other differences a fermenter can make, and one is to enable pressurized fermentations. So to see the impact of a beer brewed under 12 psi of pressure and at ambient pressure with lab tested results, watch this video here.